Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Legatum Institute uh, this evening. That's my very best um, ministerial of religion tone of voice um, that you'll be very familiar with, uh, Fiona. And welcome, welcome to the Legatum Institute and to this, the latest in a series of events that takes place under the directorship of the Culture of Prosperity program. Our guest this evening, master non-genderized term of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, is Fiona Reynolds, who is returning to us because the first time she came uh, was to a very brilliant talk given by Sir Laurie Magnus, who was uh, relaunching Historic England, actually launching Historic England. Uh, and, uh, and Fiona and I started talking about beauty at dinner afterwards. Our subject is beauty, the politics of beauty, and how to put beauty into the politics of prosperity. A big challenge for the politics of our time. Uh, Fiona's career, I, I don't need to go into in any very great detail, but her uh, expertise in this beauty business uh, goes back over uh, a few years as <laughs> Director General of the National Trust, and I dare say a concern for beauty is very useful when you're dealing with the Fellowship of Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Uh, Oliver Letwin is a most unusual British male. He is unafraid to talk about beauty, is committed to it politically and to its advancement, and is also unafraid to write about emotion. Uh, emotion, ethics, and unity of the self, I think, Oliver being the title of that famous volume. He has been Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster uh, for the past two years. He is to Tory policy perhaps what uh, the cream was to Cole Porter's coffee, <laughs> rendering palatable what might otherwise be dry and making it interesting and engaging to a general public. I'm going to start with the author, the author of The Fight for Beauty, which I've read, speed read, <laughs> and enjoyed enormously. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is a very remarkable book because it's the work of somebody who has, yes, an eye for the policy dimension and how you think about beauty politically, but it also shows a great love of England, its landscape, and also the landscapes of Wales, Scotland, and the north of Ireland. So it is actually a very British book as well. You have a thesis. You tell us that there once was a time when beauty was part of the general vocabulary. People were unashamed to talk about beauty. And then something big and bad happened, and we found ourselves unable to use the language. We, we, we used language of environmentalism. So tell us about the time when beauty was part of the common language, the lingua franca, and why did we stop talking about it? I think actually beauty has always been something that us as people have talked about. We know what we love and we love our countryside and we love the architecture and the history of this country. But I point to two historical periods actually where beauty became a live political issue and it made a difference to public policy. The first was in response to the intense experience of industrialization which not only was incredibly fast but also incredibly damaging to many of the attributes that people thought were important. And people like Ruskin stood up and said, there, there needs to be another way. This sort of sheer sort of uh, determinism of the, the pursuit of money and the pursuit of industrial goals is just not capturing the <coughs> things that we as humans most need. And actually out of that came many things. It came the National Trust, but also came the early planning system with people like Octavia Hill and others campaigning for the beauty of the surroundings that people needed to enjoy. And I talk also about the post-war period where designed very much by the coalition government, the post-war reconstruction programme was explicitly designed not only to meet people's material needs for homes, for jobs, for um, 
you know, the practical things like food, but also our spiritual needs for, for education, for health, and for national parks, access to the countryside, the protection of nature. And it wasn't seen as a sort of let's have the economy first and then an add on. It, these things were seen as integral, as related. And in fact, the pursuit of harmonization was an explicit goal. And that lasted quite a long time. But in a sense, what I'm saying in the book is that we sort of got captured, if you like, by what I call economism. It's a horrible word, but it was a phrase that just, just seemed to sort of sum it all up, that we think the only thing that matters is things that you can count, you know, whether we're, economy is growing, whether GDP is going in the right direction. And actually, we know that's not true. But also, we know, if we're honest, that we can't live our lives like that. And we need to think in a different way about what we, what we value. So I'm calling for beauty to be back on the agenda. Actually, Oliver, you're right, is the only politician who's ever really talked about beauty. And I want every politician to talk about beauty and to acknowledge that it has this profound impact on our lives. It matters. We can't ignore it. And if we do, it's our peril. Well, that speaks very much to a very typical Legato theme of how to bring all the disciplines and ways of thinking together in various patterns that might be called integrated or synoptic, joined up thinking in government, Chancellor Duchy of Lancaster, mm -hmm. or is that great aspiration? Why is it so difficult for beauty to find its place at the heart of government? Um, I, I don't think it is actually um, so much a matter of it not uh, being considered inside uh, government. Um, uh, there are there are people in the room I spot who are or have been senior civil servants who under, I suspect, successive regimes have found themselves having conversations about how you preserve beauty or how you enhance beauty of many different kinds in many different places. Uh, I think where it's missing, where I, I agree with Fiona that there's a, there's a gap, um, is in our political discussion, um, which of course doesn't go on mainly inside government, but in our democracy as a whole. Um, and I, can, I think I can identify uh, why at the moment it's not very uh, fashionable to talk about um, uh, beauty in, in, uh, in political debate. Um, uh, and the answer is, I uh, can testify from personal experience, is as soon as you do, everyone thinks you're a complete crank. <laughs> um, uh, and um, it doesn't sound um, chunky and real. Um, Actually, I don't think it is just a question of uh, what's numerical or not, though I agree that plays a part. Um, th there are other things which are, are not easy to uh, condense into numbers, like um, people's health, people's mental health, um, uh, people's level of education, um, uh, the, uh, the extent to which um, the elderly are well cared for, which are very... Uh, central, emotional, <coughs> intangible things which are talked about all the time in politics. Nobody has any hang-ups about talking about them. But for some reason, um, beauty is regarded as if uh, uh, you were talking about uh, the moon being made of cream cheese or something. It's sort of off the map. <coughs> and um, uh, uh, it's very difficult to take something that's off the political map and bring it onto the political map without incurring a great deal of uh, opprobrium on the way. And um, politicians are naturally reluctant to incur even more opprobrium than we have all the time. So that's, I think, the explanation. Now, the question, to my mind, the practical question is, what do we do about this situation? How do we, how do we uh, re-enable ourselves to talk in national and international terms about something which, and I think Fiona's absolutely right about this, at local level, people are very, very conscious of, not just in our own lives, as, as you go about your daily life, and, and I suspect most people in this room and most people outside this room are struck minute by minute, hour by hour, by what they see, what they smell, what they feel, what they sense around them. The, the, the shape and feel of the place you live in is incredibly important to most people. But also, actually, if you have a, um, if you have a meeting in a, in a village uh, or a neighbourhood of a city, about something that affects the look of the place, you can guarantee that there'll be a full turnout. So people are very, very concerned about these things at local level. It's a question of how we make what it's possible to talk about locally 
be possible to talk about nationally without it sounding as if it's sort of weird and wonderful. And uh, I clearly don't know the answer to that because I've sort of tried and hopelessly failed to engage uh, other people in this, uh, in this debate. But uh, maybe Fiona's book will do what uh, the rest of us have failed to do. Well, um, thank you. I'm very keen that we have a crisply conducted debates and exchange of views uh, from our guests this evening. And uh, perhaps I could just throw one question at you. Um, different people have different ideas of what beauty is. Does this make it a political problem? Um, <coughs> well, it's certainly true that different people have different ideas about what beauty is. Um, it's also true that different people have different ideas about what fairness is or what equality is or what goodness is or, in fact, anything else that really matters. Um, this is why life is so interesting. We disagree about these really important things. We don't seem to have any difficulty talking about any of them. So I can't see why that should prohibit us. I'm not, sure people, I'm not yeah, sure people do. I mean, I think what's very interesting is that when you ask people, there is extraordinary consensus about what mm. people find beautiful. And actually, both of us, Publica did some very interesting work on this last year, but CABE, the Commission on Architecture and Built Environment, did a very extensive survey. And what people like, actually, are the things that we all recognise. They like places that... Um, either in, in the countryside or in towns that are well cared for, that are pleasing, that um, actually you know, create a community that people feel comfortable living in. And they don't like litter and uh, graffiti and the things that demonstrate a, a lack of care. Yeah. What I think we argue about is, is, is not the vast majority, but just, I think, something new. And just as Ruskin and Wordsworth you know, hated the railway, and we now have preservation societies, you know, protecting old steam railways, wherever you look. Actually, when it's new, it's frightening. So perhaps that's one reason why wind farms have been so controversial or some of the renewable energy projects. It's not that they are intrinsically not beautiful or wrong. It's that we're, we're learning how to accommodate them. And one of the points I am very keen to see debated is actually how can we build the idea of talking about beauty into our planning system? It, it, you're right, it's just seen as soft and a bit flabby. And actually... We know that these are really fundamentally important questions. And it's not just about aesthetics either, it's about what is right. And if you go back to that post-war government, one of the things that was really um, surprisingly kind of well articulated was a, a philosophy <coughs> around the right use of land. You know, recognising that we live in a planet where we actually have enormous pressures on our land, both for farming and for development. And actually, we, we can, if we work at it, create... Uh, uh, a set of proposals that, that manage to meet most people's need rather than fighting about you know, one side or the other. And so this idea of harmony, this idea of integration and recognising that controversy can develop or help us develop you know, more beautiful, more constructive solutions if we talk about it. But if we don't even talk about it, it never even starts. You've got a, a, a marvellous account of, of Clement Attlee. Mm. as Lord mm. President of the Council mm. in 1941-42, mm. mm. beginning to think about these, these very issues. Uh, inspired by Russell. From his base exactly. in Stepney. Indeed. Of, all, Indeed. of all places. Yes. Right, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours as well as our two speakers. And uh, who is going to uh, take up the cudgels either for or perhaps against beauty? I rather assume that you're all for beauty, otherwise you might not be here. Uh, advocates against beauty um, might uh, not be that obvious. And I'm going to persist in my questioning until Laura finds somebody out there. Yes, Laura. So, um, in your book, Fiona, in the yeah. first few chapters, you chart um, the aesthetic movement, mentioning Ruskin, mentioning A.E. Houseman, and then you stop in the... Uh, 21st century, there's no Eliot, there's no Larkin. Do you think that the vision of beauty in your book is an outmoded one that doesn't make space for a modern aesthetic? No, not at all. Um, I mean, there is clearly an enormous literature, both historically and today. I mean, just think of the nature writers today whose books are selling like um, hotcakes and who write, you know, lyrically and beautifully about the importance of nature, about the importance of you know, the quality of our lives. I think it, it's simply this fundamental question of does that actually bite 
you know, does that make a difference? And I'm also charting, you know, some very, very serious trends <coughs> in terms of our use of natural resources, you know, the, the, the damage we're doing to our soil, the, the risks that we are, you know, living our lives so unsustainably. And I'm, I'm really questioning how we can get onto a more sustainable <coughs> footing and looking to <coughs> beauty and people's love of beauty as a way of drawing those arguments together and making better policies and, 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 and a better future. Yes, sir. I think what that exchange illustrates an important point in itself. It's perfectly allowed in today's politics to talk about literature and theatre and music and opera and pop music and art. I doubt anybody here would think it was very odd if we were having a debate about any of those things. And the, you know, what happens to the Arts Council and how important it is to keep up. These are all the subject of political debate every day of the week. Um, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, Eliot or Shakespeare, th these are permissible. Somehow or other, the way things look, so um, uh, natural beauty and um, the, the way that um, our architectural heritage shapes the way things look and the way that our um, farming practices and our traditions shape the way the countryside looks and the way that it smells on a morning if you wake up in Dorset and the way it smells if you live next to a sulphur producing factory. These things you're not allowed to talk about. Mm -hmm. But actually they're the things that more oh, yeah. closely affect most people most days of most weeks. I mean some of us are very devoted to spending time with art and literature and so on. But um, uh, uh, it's pretty, pretty much impossible to spend as much time doing that as we are all, I mean, I'm sitting here now looking out of that window. And looking out of that window, there are some things there that are really rather beautiful, and there are some things that are plainly hideous. How have, has this come about, and does it matter? Well, it matters because I'm looking at it. I can't avoid it. I, I, I don't have the privilege of reading your book just at the moment, and I haven't got Eliot sitting here or Shakespeare on stage. But that's right in front of me, and that's what we're not allowed to look at. And I don't think that's a question of outmoded aesthetics. Or I think that's, that's permanent. It's true every century, every decade, that we're faced with a physical environment that presents itself either as beautiful or ugly. And incidentally, I agree with what Fiona was saying a moment ago, that there's not actually that much debate about what is beautiful, or certainly not that much debate about what is ugly, when you compare it with the amount of debate there is about any other things I mentioned. Uh, we mainly agree about murder being wrong, and we mainly <laughs> agree that quite a lot of things which are built and quite a lot of uh, landscapes that are left in certain conditions are ugly. So we could start with the things we agree about, and even those things we don't manage to debate enough. <coughs> Well, that would get us into a debate about Britain's planning system, which forms part of our architectural prosperity program. So you'll have to yeah. come back and talk about that as well at a later stage. Uh, Louis, a microphone along there, if you please. And uh, when, you, when you ask your questions, ladies and gentlemen, could you just tell us who you are? And uh, we've got a lot to get through uh, because we do need to finish by about 7.30. So be crisp, if you please. Richard McCrory, uh, UCL. Fiona, if um, Dieter Helm read your book and suddenly decided, let's put beauty into the Natural Capital Committee, do you think that would be a terrible mistake or a way of getting this onto the political agenda? <laughs> I think it would be a very important thing because I don't think beauty is there. Um, I think it would be quite a challenging process. Um, obviously, I read Dieter's book as I was writing mine and I thought, and I know exactly why Dieter and I would not agree on lots of things because he does believe that eventually you can put a price on everything and I don't. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, in a way, my point is that there are mechanisms and the Natural Capital Committee is one which is grappling with how on earth do we value um, the things that up to now we haven't, you know, the, the carbon in soil and all the rest of it. And, and so I would say, yes, I mean, that's my point. Beauty should be part of those debates, but it will change the dialogue. It will change the nature of the dialogue. It will change the people who are involved. But I also think it, it's vital because I don't think we'll get the answers just by going down a numerical <coughs> approach alone. Yes. Could you get the, uh, Louis, just along there and... Thank you. Graham Henderson. Um, I was very struck by the fact you said uh, very clearly this is just the way human beings are. And uh, really, there's no mystery. Most of us, uh, most of us know what we like. Uh, and, and also, uh, Oliver, you, but, but there's no vocabulary to discuss 
beauty in the way that there is other subjects. And I'm just wondering if this is a case for the philosophers. Is this a sort of phenomenological question? You know, do we need philosophers to start articulating our human meanings a little bit more coherently? Right. Well, we'll round up two or three questions <laughs> at that stage and give Oliver time to think about the new philosophical lexicon. Yeah. Uh, and yes, madam. Yeah. Hello, Sarah Apple. Uh, I'm one of the I former senior right. civil servants that Oliver may have recognised. And I just wanted to challenge on the politics of not being allowed to talk about it. Um, our experience is often that it's the controlled message from the centre. And I just wondered if maybe the politicians started talking about it much more freely. Um, and it's quite noticeable that there hasn't been much discussion at all about the environment in all the um, mm -hmm. furore at the moment about the EU debate and Brexit. I wondered if you'd like to comment on that. Right, too, and then, yes, v uh, very right at the back, yes. Blacks and Houston. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a story on the um, subject of politics and beauty about the uh, development of the National Trust uh, Visitor Centre at the Giants <laughs> Causeway in Northern <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jack, that's a very big question. Mm. Um, I'm sure Oliver has things to, on the whole question of philosophy. I mean, I think when I got really frightened when I was writing my book, it's because I realised I was treading into very deep waters, and I actually retrenched to experiences that I know and, and sort of areas where I feel comfortable. Um, and of course, there is a very deep, a very deep sense of, sort of both spiritual and philosophical writing about beauty, which um, I haven't attempted to penetrate. But in a way, my point is that I think that. My real profound point is that I think beauty itself is a word that just needs to be lifted up and talked about. And we can have all kinds of deep analyses, but actually the point is, it's a word, as I say, that used to be common in public policy and now isn't. And it's a word that works. And I think we have so many sort of made up words like biodiversity and ecosystem services. And I, I'm not knocking them because they're kind of part of our lexicon now, but they don't resonate with people. They don't inspire people, whereas I think beauty does. And that's really why I'm just saying let's just let's just use it and celebrate it and enjoy it. Um, and there is a, uh, a rather bad tradition which says on one hand, there's something called the beautiful. On the other hand, there's something called the useful. Uh, the argument in your book is that the William beautiful Morris is the useful. Both, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oliver, what about a... Who's asking for a philosophical lexicon? Yes, <laughs> there, to enable us to reintroduce beauty into the public domain. And the dangers are too much control from the centre. Um, well, I'm going to say something which will be very unpopular with any, um, uh, anybody who thinks that, um, that philosophy is useful. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I should explain for the avoidance of doubt that I spent my early years um, um, being a very bad philosopher. Um, uh, and I intend to spend my later years being, no doubt, sadly, an equally bad philosopher. But that's because I enjoy it, not because it's useful. Um, and I think um, if you understand philosophy, then you understand precisely why it should not try to solve practical problems. Um, uh, it just turns into bad philosophy and bad practice all at once. Um, no, I don't think the philosophers can solve this problem at all. I think it's um, uh, the politicians and the journalists and the people in this room that need to solve this problem. Um, uh, um, uh, is it about message control from the centre? No, I don't think so, because um, message control from the centre, uh, which in incidentally is very far from perfect, is it? <laughs> um, uh, um, will, will always follow what it is that it's possible to say. So when, when spaces are opened up um, rhetorically, then people who are trying to win elections and persuade people and so on use those spaces to do so. When a space is closed down, which is what I think Fionn and I both feel has happened here, um, neither individual politicians nor the political system as a whole will, I mean, the party system or anything else, will, will seek to occupy it because it's too, too closed. Um, if, if we could persuade all the journalists to take this seriously, you could guarantee all the politicians would take it seriously. If you could persuade all the politicians to take it seriously, you can guarantee the journalists would have to talk, start taking it seriously. The condition we're in is that neither the journalists nor the politicians take this seriously. Um, 
uh, it's very interesting, the, the, the form of the question you asked about, and say I'm not going to talk about the EU at all, but the, the, the form of the question you asked is, you, you immediately said about the environment. Now, the environment is something we're allowed to talk about, but it immediately means all these, incidentally, incredibly important natural capital, ecological things, which are about the sustaining of life in a pleasant form on our planet, and uh, the maintenance of the historical record and the biodiversity of the seas. I spent a lot of time over the last few years trying to create a marine zones around the world. And if I explain that in terms of biodiversity and ecological sustainability of the oceans, it's fine. But if I said what I really think, which is that there is an incredible storehouse of beauty there that needs to be preserved for the sake of uh, preserving it, uh, I'd be laughed out of court. So I resort to all these others, which incidentally are true. That's mm. to say, it is mm. important that mm. there should be mm. biodiverse oceans simply for natural capital purposes. But, but one has to talk in those terms because the other is so close. And the planning system is very interesting. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many other people in this room go to you know, meetings as any um, constituency MP does about planning all the time. I mean, Fiona's obviously been to oodles of them. Um, it is quite remarkable, the um, uh, number of absurd arguments that are made by participants to these uh, uh, discussions who are desperately trying to avoid admitting what they actually object to about something, which is as ugly. So they will tell you any number of things which don't in any way really diminish the uh, uh, argument for doing something, and they will never say, we don't want it on our back door, you know, outside our back door, because it's very ugly. Um, and why don't they? Because they all think, oh, you're not allowed to say something is ugly. That's not modern speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we have a completely phony discussion half the time in which one lot of people are saying it's not ugly and another lot of people are saying it is ugly and neither of them is actually saying either of these things. Um, uh, so you can't tell what they really mean at all. It's a terrible confusion we got ourselves <coughs> into. That there are therefore good practical reasons for getting back to talking about beauty in context where that is what we actually mean. In the end, you can't run two sets of books, one the truth and one what you speak in. You just get terribly confused. Which makes the Prince of Wales' Beauty in My Backyard initiative particularly valuable, since he's unfair to talk yeah. about beauty. Right, uh, another quick round up, ladies and gentlemen. Lots and lots of you there. Uh, Louis, just to your left there, sir. And then we'll go around a few. Then uh, Deborah uh, along there. And N Nigel Haig, um, Fiona, in, you, in your book you refer to the, you quote the National Trust Act of, of 1907, which uses the word beauty, mm -hmm. but nowhere else do you quote any act of parliament which uses the word beauty, and I assume, therefore, you haven't found one, because oh, there, there would are, have been. Sorry, there are. There, there are. are, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and when was the last one? Because well, certainly 1949. <coughs> right, because I... <laughs> <laughs> In the, pre in the preamble, probably. That's it. Yes. Well, no, 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 in the legislation. In the that's legislation. it. That was well, the in, the, in, in Duncan Sands' Civic Amenities Act of 1967, I looked at that to see if the word beauty is there. It's not, but it comes jolly close because yeah. it places a duty on local authorities to identify areas um, whose um, character and appearance need to be preserved or enhanced. So, I mean, that's a kind of bureaucratic... Um, euphemism mm. for beauty. Mm. It's not quite saying beauty, but it actually gives everybody who uses that act, and they still do, the, 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 the stick to beat their local authority saying you should designate this area because we want to enhance its appearance. So it seems to me it's a Trojan horse. You want beauty into the planning system. It's jolly nearly there in that act. So with a nod there <coughs> to the late uh, Lord Duncan Sands, father of Laura, uh, and Deborah. Thank you. I'm Deborah Lamb from Historic England. I just want to give an example, actually, rather than ask a question around the use of the word ugly. Um, because um, when Historic England, English Heritage as it was, um, opposed the construction of the walkie-talkie, we issued a press release that said, this is ugly, this will be ugly. And when it came to the public inquiry, we were really roasted for mm. being an official government body that used a word like ugly, and we had a really tough time over it. So there is something about 
the, the kind of arena of public policy, and perhaps it's just within the planning system, when it comes down to very specific decisions and places, just can't cope with that kind of language when it comes to making decisions. So it's a bit too in your face a term for the grand world of public policy, perhaps ugly. Quick roundup going on. Yes. Um, Harry Scott, I'm a, I'm a landowner, but also chairman of the Forestry Commission. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was about natural capital, which was more of a, a statement, really, or, or something I think is excitement, exciting and I would like to, Oliver to comment on, which is in, I've been in the process of preparing natural capital accounts. You know, we'll publish them shortly. And one of the things that comes up is, in fact, all these natural capital attributes beyond the financial are hugely subjective. And one of the things you should do when you're preparing natural capital accounts is identify the things that you cannot quantify. So I would actually argue, and would be interested in your comments, that a natural process of natural capital is indeed extending the language with which you can talk about beauty. The second uh, thing, which was really the question I wanted to ask, was part of beauty and part of the areas in the natural environment we talk about beauty are the historically impoverished areas, the places where we are probably spending huge amounts of money in a sort of capability brown type way of trying to recreate an environment which is not inherently natural when, allow, when you allow the normal economic process to take place. And my question is, to what extent should we try to redesign our landscape to make sure that it's economically driven <coughs> rather than artificially push against the current constraints? Right, so, and then just uh, one more, right at the, uh, Louis, right at the back there. <coughs> Uh, my name is Robert Hewis, and this is a question for Oliver Letwin uh, in an effort to take politicians seriously. What, in your view, is the current Secretary of State for Culture's definition of beauty? Very good question. <laughs> Fiona, do you want well, to... Do you, we have yeah, three questions here. Yeah. The, the language of ugliness, the language yeah, of beauty is yeah. a bit too in your face for people. Well, we've got two sets of questions, haven't we? We've got things that people don't like and how, how, can, we, how can we articulate what we don't like in a, in a confident way? And then I think also Harry's point about how do we create you know, places which actually respond to these human desires for beauty, but which actually work. And I think you know, the one thing I'd say, all of this country is completely man-influenced and, and, and made. And you know, I'm, I'm an obsessive Hoskins devotee, as you, anyone who's read the book will know. And I think it's, it's really important to recognise that we have been manipulating both our urban areas and our countryside for many, many thousands of years. I, I'm trying to say around particularly the, the rural landscapes that we can have a future that we haven't, in a sense, yet experienced. It's not about going back to something. Um, and national parks are a really good example where actually we're finding that the new economy of national parks is hugely successful, provided it's built on sustainable land management, on you know, the excitement of, of, of sort of local food, the um, you know, tourism activities which enhance rather than detract from the landscape. And actually we're, we're building a proposition there which is very like that post-war vision for integration and harmony. Um, when it comes to cities, I think we're in a pickle actually, and there are people in this room who know far more about the detail of you know, sustainable cities than I do, but what is very, very clear is we have an enormous challenge if we're going to live together harmoniously in the densities that we need to in our cities. They, in a sense, hold the key to our future. But we can't just live without thinking about beauty and about how to not develop in, a, in an ugly way. So we need both the language and the mechanisms to think about nature in cities, about uh, walkability, to think about services near each other so we're not dependent on the car, to, to think about the kind of redesign of, of the way we, we plan for urban areas such that we get beauty and useful and sustainable and integrated <laughs> ambitions. And I think all of that, I think the debate about ugliness and beauty actually helps us articulate uh, what we mean and what we would find useful. And it's, it's actually pretending that there's some kind of economic solution that I think is driving us in the wrong direction. Uh, well, publication of Hoskins's book, mid-1955. Yeah. The Making of the English Landscape, a crucial book really because it, it taught a lot of people <laughs> and a lot of townies that actually the landscape is always being made and remade and it's a story of human history. Indeed. It's not something that's just given us. It's a, it's a product of human endeavour. 
Um, Oliver, the artificiality of the, of, the, of the design landscape is surely always with us. Uh, well, it's artificial in the sense that it's partly made by human beings, but so. Um, uh, f first of all, um, uh, all I can say about John Whittingdale is that I've wandered around parts of Sherborne where um, parts of his family live, and which is in my constituency, and um, stood and gazed with him at um, the ruins of Sherborne Abbey, and I rather think he has the same view of beauty as most of us in this room do. Um, and incidentally, I think that's true of about 650 of the 650 colleagues I have in the House of Commons. I don't think it's that politicians don't appreciate beauty. Um, I think it's that one isn't allowed to talk about it. That's a different thing. Um, uh, but I, I want to sort of pursue where you, you and Fiona were talking about in the light of Harry Sutton's uh, uh, question. And um, in particular, I, 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 I somewhat disagree with Fiona about this, this one thing. Um, Actually, economics is not nearly as impoverished a science as I think um, you're tending to suggest. Um, it's perfectly capable of attaching value to highly intangible things. It does it in a rather uh, odd way compared to our normal experience, because it's a science, and science does things in very particular ways, depending on which science it is. It's true also that uh, one wouldn't normally describe um, the movement that uh, you know, someone is making in the room at the moment in terms of... Uh, the uh, uh, interactions of molecules and atoms, you'd say that someone is moving their heads. So physics also describes things in odd ways, but it doesn't mean it can't describe what we also see at the human level. And similarly in economics, actually, there is a highly developed sense of uh, sort of philosophic calculus, which enables you to attach values to the beauty of things. And some of this is done by um, a price. Um, uh, Picassos are very valuable. Uh, we know this because people have been paying an enormous amount for them. Um, and actually people are willing to go and pay uh, huge amounts to travel on airplanes to go and see beautiful things. And so there are all sorts of ways in which economists, if they're being clever, can measure the economic. This isn't the whole value of beauty any more than it's the whole value of anything else. Uh, you, it's not the case that uh, love and marriage are only valuable because they sustain uh, economies, but as a matter of fact, they do also have economic effects, and the economists can value uh, beauty. So it isn't the, the, isn't the lack of putting a number on it that's the real issue. The real issue is we're dead scared of even doing that. Um, so uh, um, uh, when you say your natural capital accounts, um, obviously a, a full, a complete sense of natural capital must include the extent to which uh, the, uh, the, the country, the, the part of the country, the town, the, whatever it is that we live in, is uh, helping us to live better. Uh, um, and, you know, in the end, um, uh, what, what, what is prosperity about? I mean, I, there, I, I doubt there's anybody in this room, there might be someone in this room who really literally just wants to accumulate piles of pound notes, but as far as I'm aware, pound notes are really rather boring objects. Uh, the reason you want pound notes is because of things they get you. And the reason you want the things they get you is because they give you satisfaction and enhance your life. And so does beauty. So it's not that there's beauty over here that's totally useless and outside everything else, and then everything else which is useful and uh, monetizable. On the contrary, beauty like love and like friendship and like uh, people being good and nice to one another and like looking after elderly people and like mental health provision and so on. All these things are immensely valuable and beauty is just as valuable as they are and in much the same kinds of ways. I think, I think, I mean, of course, I think, I think, you know, you and I and everyone in this room would say that. I think, I think many politicians would outside of the political arena. But when you think, think of GDP, I mean, how sensible is GDP as a way of measuring? And it's the single most important way that we measure progress in this country. A GDP measures profit, loss and production. It does not have a balance sheet. And anybody who knows anything about natural resources or even, you know, running our own businesses or organisations knows that the balance sheet is whether what t tells us if we're, if, if we're sustaining the fundamental resource we depend on. So actually, I think it's true. It must be that in politics, um, people feel these things. But when all that matters is GDP, no. we are absolutely but barking Fiona, at you. Fiona and Oliver, should we therefore find a way of factoring in? computing beauty 
as an equation or as an element within the calculation of GDP? I am not for equations. You can probably tell that. <laughs> but I, do, I think this is about the qualities that we want. And I know that makes it more complicated and difficult, but the truth is life is complicated and difficult. And we used to be able to do this better. And I, th I think we are in a pickle at the moment because we seem to think that if GDP is going in the right direction and the economy is growing in those terms, then we're fine. And actually, we're not fine because we are using resources far too quickly. We are uh, destroying nature is, is in a very vulnerable state, as I, I set out in the book. We've got to do things differently. And what I'm saying is that we had a different set of aspirations that, of course, GDP, I'm sure, will be one of the things we look at. And rather than just turn GDP into a, an even more singing and dancing mm -hmm. monkey, you know, I would say, let's just weigh other things into the... Into well, the but yeah. so Oliver, but GDP know, comes well, in yes, for a bit of bashing. This is where we, where, where we really don't have the same analysis. Mm. Um, of course, of course, GDP is not anything that matters. And nobody thinks it does. Um, well, I, well then, no, no, but they don't. <laughs> if you look at... If, it's just not true. If you look at political discourse in this country, on, right across the spectrum, from left to right, mm -hmm. people are constantly debating things about relationships and families and uh, care and health and all sorts of things that are not part of GDP in any ordinary sense. And there's been no serious objection to the development, which is a hugely welcome phenomenon over the past uh, 5, 10, 15 years, uh, uh, that both you and I have, have participated in, and many others, including Dieter and so on, uh, of both at international level and national level of uh, balance sheets, uh, of the concept of natural capital, uh, and of, of a whole series. All of these things are perfectly talkable about. And, and, then, and indeed, we, there's been a great deal of attention, which I've myself been much involved in, in trying to measure well-being. And actually now, although maybe 15 or 20 years ago, you couldn't speak about well-being without being somewhat uh, derided, now you can. And um, uh, actually, I think um, uh, it's a caricature to say that GDP is all that matters in British politics. It isn't. Um, the problem is when you have all these other things which do matter and are debated in, in British politics and aren't just to do with GDP, many of which are to do with balance sheets and, and, and go beyond uh, a year-by-year -year analysis, actually they still don't include beauty. That is what is really strange here. And, and I, 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 the only um, analogous thing I can think of is that whereas in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries it was probably impossible to talk about politics at all seriously without talking about religion, now in Britain, wow. and in some ways when you see America you can see why, but nevertheless, uh, it's almost impossible to talk about politics and talk about religion. Hmm. Um, uh, so religion to some degree and beauty almost completely mm. is sort of excluded mm. and mm. it's the unnaturalness of that that I'm inveighing mm. against. So I, we, we don't share mm. entirely our view about, mm. the view about <coughs> GDP. Well, a love of the beautiful as the sublime was sometimes a, a replacement religion, of course, for uh, Christian orthodoxy. Uh, an awful lot of questions here.